being the same thing as a PhD. Um, at Oxford, I'm a member of Trinity College and um, I'm primarily based in the department, department of pharmacology, um, which is part of the medical sciences division. And most of my work is um, centered around ion channels and specifically I look at chloride channels and how they're involved in creating electrical currents in the human body and why they're important. So hopefully over the next half hour, I'll be able to convince you that ion channels are a really important area of human physiology and they underpin um, a lot of uh, physiological processes in both health and also in disease. Um, so I'll just give a quick um, overview of my, my background and my journey as it were. Um, so I'm from Surrey. I went to my local um, state school and I stayed there for my A-levels, which I did in biology, chemistry and maths. I also did AS English literature, although I'm aware AS's don't exist anymore. Um, I don't think. And I also did an extended project, which I know Richard was just talking about. And actually, I really, again, if that's an opportunity that's available to you, I really recommend doing that. Um, I looked at the ethics of pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, which is a type of genetic testing that can be coupled with IVF. And um, I had an interview at Cambridge and it formed a, a, a part of my, my interview there for undergrad. And it's, uh, if nothing else, it's really nice to be able to have uh, a specific topic that you can generate to talk about in your interview rather than um, something that you know is likely to come up and you're comfortable talking about. Um, However, I went to the University of York for my undergrad. Um, I studied biochemistry and I did a year in industry. Um, and it, oh, oh, as, as something else, a year in industry, I'd also really recommend if that's an opportunity that's available as part of your degree. If you're interested in doing um, science-based work in your future or doing internships in the summer um, and a benefit, I think, of um, the Oxford term lengths is that there is more vacation time so a lot of people can do um, sort of longer summer internships as well. So I did a year in industry working at Eli Lilly for a year um, and that was my first insight really into how academic and industrial labs work and what it's like to do scientific research um, day in day out and fortunately I really enjoyed it. Um, so I applied to do my DPhil at Oxford um, Specifically, I'm on a programme called Oxion, which stands for um, Oxford Ion Channel Initiative, um, which is why I'm focused on ion channels. And I'm a member of Trinity College and I'm primarily based in the Tomorrow Lab. And we look at chloride channels in the vasculature. Um, so I will start, oh, I should say, if anybody has any questions or wants me to um, repeat something or explain something a different way, please feel free to say. Um, so I'll start off by asking, what are your first impressions when you think about electricity in, in human biology or in the human body? My apologies. So if you go to the Slido link, there should be a, um, a poll. And I will stop presenting this and start presenting that. So hopefully that's worked. Amazing, yeah, the nervous system is um, the big answer that's coming up at the moment. And I think that's, for a lot of people, that's our first impressions when we think about electricity. Um, because electricity underpins how the nervous system works and how impulses are transmitted in the nervous system. Yeah, so great. And reflexes are mentioned here, um, which yeah is all part of the same, um, the nervous system and how we can respond to stimuli. Um, so feel free to keep um, putting responses into here. So I'll do a quick um, very, very quick historical overview while you're doing that. So um, we first were kind of aware that electric electricity was involved in how the body works um, back over 200 years ago, back at the late, late 1700s, um, when a scientist called Galvani tried stimulating um, a frog's leg with a pulse of electricity. And he found that the frog's leg on its own 
detached frog's leg could um, twitch and it caused muscle contraction in this leg. And um, this was kind of the first insight that anybody had into the fact that electricity might be involved in um, how, how we work as humans and animals. And um, this uh, provided inspiration, for example, for Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. So the idea that we can reanimate using electricity is obviously a little bit fanciful, but um, yeah, it all comes from the same idea. So over the last 200 years, um, various scientists have made um, further discoveries in working out how electricity works on a more molecular level. So yeah, we have some really good responses here. Nerv yeah, the nervous system has come up quite a lot. Also signals for muscle contraction. Yeah, that's also really important. So that's the coupling between how um, nerves can stimulate the contraction in muscles and muscle contraction itself is underpinned by electricity. So I will go back to my slides. Yeah, so thank you very much for participating in the poll. So if we want to understand how electricity works, um, we first need to go back into thinking about how cells are structured and specifically how the cell membrane is structured. So um, this is a diagram that a lot of you might be quite familiar with seeing. It's like a cartoon of an animal cell. Um, and um, as with all eu eukaryotic cells, on the inside we have membrane-bound organelles. And around the outside of the cell itself, we also have a cell membrane. And this is composed of phospholipids. So we have a diagram on the right-hand side of the slide, which a little cartoon of a phospholipid. So they have these phosphate head groups, which are hydrophilic, that means water-loving and lipid tails, which are hydrophobic, as you might be able to relate to if you've ever mixed um, fats or oils and water. And when you put phospholipids into water, they spontaneously form these structures that protect the lipids from being in contact with the water molecules. And in the case of a cell, the extracellular environment and the, cell, the cytoplasm on the intracellular um, are both water-based, they're both aqueous. And so the cell membrane, the, phosph the phospholipids in the cell membrane form this bilayer structure whereby the phosphate groups are in contact with the aqueous intra and extracellular environments. And then the lipids on the inside are sort of protected from that. And because of this structure, this bilayer is semi-permeable. And that means that a lot of things can't cross through the cell membrane without help of some sort. So the membrane's permeable to very small and um, non-polar molecules. So things like oxygen and carbon dioxide, urea, they can diffuse across the membrane of their own accord. Um, but anything that's bulky or hydrophilic, so that includes um, sugars and amino acids are quite bulky and hydrophilic, um, so anything that's polar or charged, can't cross through the membrane or certainly would do so very, very, very slowly on its own. And so oops, to, allow, um, to allow these solutes to be transported from one side of the membrane to the other, we have various proteins that are embedded in the cell membrane um, and these facilitate transport of some sort. Um, mostly going to focus on channels today but i'll do a very quick sort of general overview of the other types too so ion channels allow passive diffusion across the cell membrane and so in this example generic blue molecule um, can diffuse from an area of high concentration to an area of lower concentration so channels essentially form pores or kind of like a hole across the cell membrane that allows these things to cross from one side to another and then um, we also have carrier proteins which bind to the molecule on one side of the membrane and they have to physically change configuration to move the molecule from one side to the other. And in some cases, this can be also down the diffusion gradient from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. Um, so this is facilitated diffusion. But in other cases, um, with an input of energy, this can be used to 
physically pump molecules from one side to the other, and this is called active transport. Um, so there are various subtypes of pumps and carriers, which you may or may not address at school. Um, but today we're going to focus in more on channels and specifically ion channels. So as you might be able to see from this schematic here, we have um, a, an ion channel in green, which is embedded in the plasma membrane and signal molecules bind to the outside of the closed channel and these cause the channel to open and then ions can flux down their diffusion gradient and in this case they're fluxing to the inside of the cell um, because they're on a higher concentration outside. However, as uh, many of you are probably aware, ions by definition are charged. They are atoms which have gained or lost an electron, which results in a net positive or a net negative charge. And these are some of the main ions we think about when we think about signaling in the body. So we have calcium, potassium and sodium, and these are all cations that are positive. We also have chloride, which is negatively charged. It's an anion. And because they're charged, the movement of ions from one side of the membrane to the other constitutes an electrical current. Um, and the inside of a cell at rest is more negative than the outside. And this is a general rule. And then different cells are will be more negative than other cells. Different types of cells are more negative than others. Um, but the, the resting membrane potential, we say, of a nerve, for example, a neuron, is minus 70. So at rest, the inside of the cell is minus 70 millivolts more negative than the outside. And this adds like an extra level of uh, complexity that I guess we think about when we think about how ions are going to move across the membrane. So in this example here, if we then give these ions a positive charge, not only is the concentration gradient encouraging the ions to move to the inside of the cell, um, but the electrical gradient is also encouraging the ions to the inside of the cell because the inside of the cell is more negative and the ions are positively charged. However, if we then think about these ions as if they're negatively charged, they're anions, the concentration gradient would move the ions to the inside of the cell, but the electrical gradient would encourage the ions to stay on the outside because they're negatively charged and the inside of the cell is also negatively charged. And so it's a little bit harder to predict what direction that the ions are going to move in when this channel opens. And so the balance between these two gradients, we call the electrochemical gradient, it's the balance between the electrical gradient and the chemical gradient. And thinking about the, electrical the electrochemical gradient underpins all of ion channel physiology. So just to recap what we've spoken about so far, um, ions diffuse down an electrochemical gradient through an ion channel. And the movement of ions down that diffusion gradient constitutes an electrical current. And this is super, super quick. Um, it's very rapid. It can be up to 100 million ions per second can move through one channel. And this is much, much faster than um, with other types of transports so with carrier proteins because they have to physically change conformation in order to move the ion. They're a lot slower. So um, yeah, super quick. And they can be highly selective for a particular ion. Um, not all ion channels are super selective, but many are. So you have particular ion channels that only conduct um, or preferably conduct potassium compared to sodium or um, calcium compared to anything else, for example. And the way in which these channels can select and identify between different types of ions is the basis for some people's whole careers. Um, it's very, very intricate and you can kind of think about um, if you think about uh, the, the difference between, say, a potassium ion and a sodium ion. They both carry the same charge and the, the only difference really is that a potassium ion is a little bit bigger. It has an extra electron shell. And so the fact that an ion channel can differentiate between these two ions, despite the fact that they're so similar, is very, very interesting. Um, so that's selectivity. And then finally, ion channels are gated, and this means they 
open and close in response to a specific stimuli. Um, some common examples of stimuli for various ion channels are um, voltage, mechanical stress, so like pressure and stretch, and um, various ligands binding. Um, but there are there are other types. There are those are just examples, and we're going to think a little bit more now about voltage gated ion channels. Um, so, as I mentioned, the inside of a cell is more negative than the outside. Um, so this is the membrane voltage, the um, membrane potential. And if this changes, some ion channels are able to sense that, and they will open in response. And so certain certain types of cells will express um, specific numbers and types of ion channels that allow them to um, very rapidly change their membrane potential. And we call this an action potential. And this is the type of electrical signaling that underpins um, the transmission of an impulse in the nerve in a neuron, for example. Um, but it's also really important in um, the constriction and dilation of muscle cells in the beating of the heart, um, also in endocrine cells. So if we think about the diagram on the left at rest, there is more sodium on the outside of the cell than on the inside. And there's more potassium on the inside of the cell than on the outside. And because the ion channels are closed, they can't diffuse across the membrane. They can't um, equi equilibrate. However, if we then have a depolarizing pulse and we open the voltage sensitive sodium channel, then sodium is now able to flux across the membrane. And so what happens, sodium enters the cell because it's um, going down both its electrical gradient and its chemical gradient. So we now have sodium on the inside of the cell, but because the potassium channels haven't yet opened, potassium also stays on the inside of the cell. And so as a result, because, um, because sodium is positively charged, the inside of the cell now becomes more positive than it previously was. And we call this depolarization. Um, and then, so the potassium channels are also voltage sensitive. They are also sensitive to this depolarizing pulse. However, they've got slower kinetics, so they open more slowly than the sodium channel. So if the potassium channel now opens, the potassium, the potassium ions can now flux. And because the inside of the cell is now more positive than the outside, and there's more potassium inside than out, potassium now leaves the cell and the membrane potential as a result drops back down again so it's now at minus 90 and we call this hyperpolarization and this vague this sort of general idea underpins electrical signaling in electrically excitable cells so we can plot this change in membrane potential and we can think about what's actually happening to the ions at each stage so when the cell is at rest and the membrane potential is um, set at around minus 70 millivolts, we have um, sodium on the outside, potassium on the inside. And then we have a small stimulus here, and this can just be depolarization of a small area of the membrane. Some sodium channels start to open and we start seeing movement of sodium to the inside of the cell and the membrane potential begins to rise. And once it reaches a certain threshold, um, this whole wave is triggered and we call it an all or nothing response um, because the magnitude doesn't change. Um, it either all happens or it doesn't. So further sodium channels open, sodium enters the cell and then around this point after um, a small amount of time on the scale of milliseconds, sodium channels inactivate, they close and the potassium channels open and the repolarization step happens. Um, the membrane potential becomes more positive again. We enter hyperpolarization. And then you'll probably notice at this point that we've got almost the exact opposite scenario of where we started with. We now have potassium on the outside and sodium on the inside. And there is a, a, a protein pump, a pump which um, pumps the sodium ions back out and the potassium ions back in. And um, resets the membrane potential to the resting state. So 
this all happens in a tiny patch of membrane, but the change in membrane potential then triggers the neighbouring patch of membrane to also depolarise. And this then triggers depolarisation further down the membrane. So in a nerve cell where we have an axon um, like this, uh, a long thin area, a sort of probably familiar with the structure of a neuron, but we have the axon is sort of a long and thin area of the cell. Um, the depolarization spreads like a wave in one direction and um, can transmit an electrical impulse. Um, so the transmission of electricity this way in a neuron is the kind of archetype, I guess, of when we think about electrical excitable cells. But the same thing, an action potential like this, can also happen in muscle cells and in particular in like cardiac muscle um, or in vascular muscle. It also happens in endocrine cells. And um, these cells are called electrically excitable. And so I'm going to talk about a specific group of ion channels now called trip channels, just as an example. Um, and these are the first ones that I studied that I became particularly interested in at university. It's probably like the trigger for me choosing to study these as my um, my PhD. So trip channels, it's a super family of ion channels. Um, and you, there's a phylo phylogenetic tree here that shows their relationship to each other. But you can see there's um, six sort of subgroups, six families of trip channels within the main category. And then non-selective cation channels, which means they're permeable to calcium, sodium, um, potassium. Some of them are a little bit more selective than others, but as a general rule, they're non-selective. And they're expressed in a wide range of different tissue types, and they have different roles in those tissue types. And most trip channels can be activated by a whole range of stimuli. So they're what we call poly polymodal, which means they interpret multiple different stimulus and integrate the response. So I'm going to talk about trip V1, which is the first one, or I guess the, the most studied trip channel. Um, and trip V1 is um, involved in the sensation of pain, nociception. So it's expressed in sensory neurons and it responds to noxious or dangerous stimuli. So this diagram here that's on the right, um, you can see trip the trip channel is expressed in the membrane, it's closed at rest, um, and the channel opens in response to heat that's above 42 degrees Celsius. It also opens in response to protons, and it will open in response to capsaicin. Capsaicin is the ingredient in chili peppers that makes them hot. It's, yeah, the hotness. <laughs> so, the same channel responds to physical heat as responds to capsaicin and the same response happens. The channel opens, um, cations can influx into the cell and this causes downstream depolarization and signaling. And I like this example personally for how ion channels work because it shows how we can, in the same way that we um, sort of taste, or we sense heat when we eat a chili, um, the same, the same protein integrates that response that integrates the sense to actual physical heat. Um, and these are just a couple of the different stimuli that will activate trip V1. Um, also mustard oil, I think, um, opens trip V1. And there are a number of different trip channels, not all of them, but a number of different trip channels which are also involved in um, thermosensation and they respond to different degrees of heat and cold. Um, so the other one I'll quickly mention is trip M8, which responds to um, temperatures around 21 to 25 degrees, I think, somewhere around there, cold temperatures. Um, and it's also activated by menthol and eugenol and eucalyptus oil, um, all of which sort of feel cold, menthol being in like mint. So all of these things feel cold when you eat them and it's because it's the same channel that's responding to actual cold as is responding to these um, sensory compounds. So I'll just 
briefly um, at the end, I'll address, uh, I'll address the role of ion channels in pharmacology. Um, so in order to think about this, we first need to maybe ask what actually is pharmacology, because obviously it's not a subject that's taught at school. Um, but pharmacology is the study of how drugs affect the function of living systems. And um, academically or medically, drugs are defined as naturally derived or synthetic chemical substances that can be administered in order to produce a biological effect in a living system. So essentially, pharmacology is understanding how drugs act in the body. And there are a bunch of different fields within pharmacology, um, but um, what I do is trying to understand how drugs interact specifically with ion channels and the effect that this might have on how the ion channel is working. And so ion channels are the second largest class of drug targets after GPCR receptors. And um, so they're, they're super important. Understanding how they can work and how they can be targeted by drugs um, is really, really important in medicine. And channelopathies are diseases that develop because of the malfunctioning ion channels or because of malfunctioning ion channels. And this can be due to a loss of function or due to a gain of function. So if certain ion channels don't work, either due to genetic mutations or due to acquired issues, um, then signaling might be reduced and this causes certain diseases. But equally, certain ion channel diseases are caused by a gain of function. So if certain ion channels are too active and they signal too much, that can also cause um, various medical problems. And so the example I'm going to give here, partially because this is a cystic fibrosis is underpinned by a chloride channel, and I study chloride channels, um, is so, so cystic fibrosis. So cystic fibrosis is the disease where Amongst some other phenotypes, um, the mucus in the airways becomes too thickened and this causes difficulties with the clearance of the mucus and as a result, um, bacteria and dust and um, pathogens can accumulate in the mucus and cause pneumonias and diseases. And in um, sort of healthy airways, the cystic fibrosis receptor is a chloride channel that allows chloride ions to um, flux out of lung epithelial cells into the mucus. And the movement of ions into the mucus there then draws water into the mucus via osmosis. And so it kind of keeps the mucus hydrated. And as a result, we can clear the mucus from our airways and we can clear any of the, the bacteria and such like that get trapped in it. Whereas in patients who have cystic fibrosis, um, mutations in the channel mean, the, the most common mutation in the cystic fibrosis channel is um, affects the insertion of the channel into the membrane. So there are fewer channels in the membrane. And as a result, less chloride can be um, effluxed into the mucus. And um, as a result, less water is drawn into the mucus. And so the mucus becomes less hydrated and it becomes thicker and stickier. So this is a, a loss of function example and hopefully illustrates at one out of many um, diseases that are centred around ion channels and why ion channels are important drug targets. And so I'll just give a quick summary. So um, ion channels form gated pores across cell membranes and they allow the diffusion of ions through them. And the movement of ions across a membrane constitutes an electrical current. And so essentially they convert stimuli into electrical signals. They are involved in a vast range of biological processes and they are important pharmacological targets because of this. And understanding how they work and how we can target them is um, important medically. So, um, just I'd like to thank these are my supervisors, um, Paolo Tamaro and Stephen Tucker and the Tamaro group, which is where I'm primarily based in pharmacology. And I'd also like to thank uh, Richard for organising the Trinity Talks and um, Trinity College in general, and also the Wellcome Trust, which is uh, where my funding comes from. Um, so thank you all very much for coming along. And if anybody has any questions about either about my talk or about uh, my sort of my background and how I 
came to be doing my PhD, then please feel free to ask on Slido. Thank you so much, Claire. A lovely acknowledgement at the end, but thank you. Thank you. Um, that was just um, staggering the way you were able to make that so um, understandable, I, I, speaking as a non-scientist, if I may say. But um, yeah. um, OK, so do we have any questions for Claire? Um, your chance to engage directly with her. I've got one if you, well, I've got two actually, Claire, but if you don't mind, I'll start off with one. I don't yeah. want to hold the limelight. <laughs> oh, um, okay, I'll start, I'll start off with one. Um, very simply, are there any, this is very specific, but are there any particular sort of super curricular resources you, you know, thinking back to when you were prospective university applicant yourself, are there any sort of prospective super curricular resources you think are sort of things that you really got a lot from and that you might be able to recommend? Um, well, I think, I think the big one for me, which unfortunately isn't updated anymore, was called Citable and it's a sort of an educational resource that's run by nature and it's still online, it's just not um, sort of updated, but it's still accessible. So I think you can search that and it has sort of basic, intermediate and more expert articles about various different aspects of um, biology and life sciences. I, th I think it's just biology and life sciences. Um, so can you just about, repeat that word? Can you just repeat that name, please? Uh, citable. S citable. Is that as in yeah. C-I-T-I-T-E? Uh, S-C-I. So like science and citable mashed. So uh, yeah, S-C-I-T-A-B-L-E. Um, so yeah, I found the archived pages actually when I was putting the talk together, but unfortunately it seems to be no longer updated. I'll, I'll, I'll have a look at that and I'll make sure in the post session email that goes out to all those registered. I've, I've, I've mentioned it if I can if I can find oh, it. Great. That's lovely. Um, OK, so we have a question. Um, a couple of questions. Um, how do you defect? How do you detect the effects of these ion channels from a lab wise perspective from certain drugs? Um, that's a really interesting question and uh, something I was sort of considering incorporating into the talk, but so there are various techniques that we can use to dis to study ion channels. Um, the kind of main one, I guess, or certainly what I do, is called electrophysiology, and um, the the general principle is that we can use electrodes on the outside of the cell and also put an electrode. Um, inside the cell or kind of continuously so that it's sensing the difference in membrane potential. Um, and then if you add, uh, say, a, a drug or a stimulus that causes ion channels to open, the difference in um, membrane potential between these two electrons can be detected. So you can kind of detect currents flowing across the membrane um, yeah, using these, using these electrodes. And then um, by applying certain drugs, you can see whether or not that blocks the size of the current that you can measure. Um, so that's kind of a very broad overview of how electrophysiology works. And I'd say if you wanted to, if you're interested in um, reading more about that, what we do is called patch clamping, um, which involves kind of suctioning a pipette onto the outside of a onto the outside of a cell, and that allows you to to measure the activity of ion channels um, within the within the patch that's stuck to the outside of the pad. That was a that wasn't a great explanation, but that yeah that's the um, that's the general idea. But there are also other techniques that other people use to look at functions. So there are um, certain dyes that fluoresce in the presence of calcium, for example. So you can um, let cells take up this dye and then um, look at calcium release from the inside of the cell based on their fluorescence. Another question. Thank you. What helped you realise which section? I like the way that this is a really about discipline rather than about back to the science. Which? What helped you realise which section of science you wanted to specialise in? That's uh, a really good question. Um, I 
I chose to study biochemistry in the first place based on, I guess, guess which areas of which areas that we studied at school I was most interested in and what I was most interested in studying outside, um, I guess, super curricularly, as we discussed earlier. But it was it was purely based on what I find most interesting. So although I enjoy biology as a whole, I've always been more drawn to like the molecular side and sort of microbiology, cellular biology, molecular biology. And so I knew that I wanted to focus that more or focus on that more at university. Um, and the, certainly the biochemistry course that I was on was broad enough that we did some lectures that were sort of pure chemistry that we did with the chemists. And we also had the opportunity to do some more biology based lectures. So there was a little bit of a scope to kind of bend the course in the direction that we were more interested in. And then I've ended up specialising in ion channels kind of for the same reason. It's really just what it's a topic that when we discussed it at university and when I addressed it in my year in industry, I just found the most interesting. I thought there's a lot that we don't know about how they work. Um, there's a lot of ion channels that are still being discovered. The one that I'm doing my PhD on, um, the gene for it wasn't identified until 2019. And so we, there's so much we don't know about how it works, how drugs might activate it and the effect they have molecularly on the channel. And I think like the level of unknown in the field, I find particularly interesting. Lots to discover. Yes. Any other examples of diseases caused by channel pathies? Um, epilepsy is uh, caused by channelopathies and there are also various different um, there's there's I should say there are loads and loads and loads of different examples of channelopathies um, so these are just the first ones that come to mind but so epilepsy is caused by um, iron channels malfunctioning often gain of function mutations and so excessive neuronal firing um, but also iron channels are very very important in controlling the pace in which the heart beats and so mutations in certain ion channels can cause um, arrhythmias and uh, issues with um, the way the heart functions. Um, also hypertension and um, blood pressure and vascular tone. What kind of cells is this investigated on? Um, I don't want to say any cell, but you, electrophysiology generally can be performed on um, quite a few different types of cells. So most of my work, I use a, a cell line, a kind of like a model cell line, um, and I express the protein that I'm interested in into this cell. So it's kind of used as a, uh, like I guess, like a template sort of in which I can express the protein I'm interested in to study it. Um, but a lot of people will do electrophysiology based on neurons or based on um, yeah brain slices and um, cells in the cells in the nervous system. And then my my other question was, and this is sort of a bit about really what life looks like as an early years academic. What sort of proportion of time as you as, of your time is, is spent in the lab in terms of proportion of working hours and. Ooh. How do, what, what does that actually kind of look like? <laughs> so, like the COVID has changed things a little bit, um, but certainly pre-pandemic, um, we were based in the lab most most of the time every day. So maybe sort of nine to five, nine to six. Um, but of that, I would say maybe 60 to 70 percent of my time is spent doing experiments and then the rest of the time is spent writing and reading and analyzing data putting data together for presentations um, ideally writing my thesis <laughs> that sort of thing when you get the time eh? all the spare time you've evidently got in your hands <laughs> eh? um okay a couple of other re relatively rapid fire questions if someone had defective iron channels would they be able to have a replacement one Oh, uh, gene therapy can work by replacing ion channels um, in that sort of way by, yeah. Um, and also some medications can work by trying to um, improve the function of how some ion channels are opening and closing, I guess. Um, so yeah, sort of, I guess that's what gene therapy is aiming to do. 
Another specific one, um, if iron channels within the heart and the processes were damaged or had a defect, defect, would this be serious for the body or not cause much damage? Yes, yeah, it would be serious. Uh, well, it, it depends. So there's 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 hundreds and hundreds of different types of iron channels and um, different sort of categories. And it very much depends on which ones have problems with them and where they're expressed as to how important it could be and whether or not it has a phenotypical effect or whether or not um, in some cases, yes, it would be catastrophically bad, but it, it depends on the issue with the iron channel and the iron channels in question. Got you. Yeah. And then again, a question about sort of um, the, your course, uh, particularly while you're at York, uh, the year of industry. Do you have a choice in what topic in the course you want to study in your year of industry at uni? Or did you have a broad range of topics to study in industry? So was it was it, were you studying or were you just doing a placement or doing a combination of both? So during that year, I was just doing my placement right. and it's sort of like applying for a job, really. So although the course I was on gave me the opportunity to take that year um, and do the year in industry, essentially about 12 months beforehand, I um, applied for various schemes at various companies and you do some interviewing so yeah you have a lot of choice you can choose where you want to apply to and um, choose what kind of yeah I guess what kind of companies and what kind of areas you're most interested in. You spoke very highly of it before Claire I mean presumably it was just a totally different environment and a great practical exposure Any anything else that really sort of lingers in the mind? It's I, th I think yeah it, totally different environment about covers it. It's, it's very, very different to studying at university. And um, I think running experiments in, in real, I don't want to say real life, but like running running experiments um, where you don't know what the answer is going to be and nobody nobody's done this before and maybe you're trying to kind of troubleshoot how to put an experiment together. Um, it's very different to doing lab practicals at university and it comes with its own huge set of frustrations, but also can be really, really uh, almost addictive in a way. Um, when it works, it's really great. And so I, th I think it's, yeah, it, like an insight to how science operates when you're doing it all day, every day, and you don't know what the answers are gonna be. Um, yeah, that was really great. Did you ever have a sense, again, this is just a continuation of that question. Did you have a sense of like, you'd been in an academic environment did you have a few wobbles before you started a year in industry thinking, whoa, I'm going out into the real world here. Am I going to be able to? Because I, I had that when I finished my degree. You know, I've done well on things, but it's like, what happens if I just can't function in like, you know, an employee environment, you know? Oh, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It was, I was uh, very, very stressed <laughs> before starting. And I'd say if anyone's good, I think, like you say, almost with any field, I think when you start working and you're doing something so new, it's always going to be terrible. There's always going to be a steep learning curve. And don't forget that like everybody's gone through this. Every employee, no matter how like important and um, uh, confident they seem, everybody's gone through the first few days and when they really don't know what they're doing. And um, I think particularly running experiments for the first time, everything is new and there's so much to learn. And um, yeah. It just everyone's gone through that and don't don't feel like it's just you or that you're not competent enough or whatever. Um, the words imposter syndrome spring to mind and, and oh. may I quickly <laughs> add that you know I haven't met anybody who hasn't felt some sense of imposter syndrome and you know as we've been having some school school groups in college today and we're all talking about it and everybody currently a student at the university was saying yeah yeah, I totally had that when I came here and everybody they know at every university has it when you're making that big transition. We've got, got a lovely question here. I'm thinking about studying pharmacology at university. I was wondering what kind of careers one could go into linked to pharmacology. Well, oh, that's very relevant to me because I'm in the last year of my DPhil, really. Um, so there's a whole range of different careers. Some of them, I guess, are more intuitive, like working in a pharmaceutical industry or becoming an academic. Um, but I know people who have gone into um, science communications, which is all about sort of being able to translate scientific information into being accessible to the public, maybe. Um, 
people I know people who've gone on to work for charities like the British Heart Foundation or um, like the Wellcome Trust again sort of in public engagement um, editing and sort of putting together journals um, but also things like teaching and I also think some people go into working on the sort of biomedical side of the NHS and uh, sort of lab lab testing for patients and that kind of side of work um, but yeah there's there's a there's a number of different careers and some of them are kind of more directly associated with lab work than not depending on what you end up being more interested in great um i'm gonna I, i'm in two minds as to whether to ask a particular question and the sim very simply is i just think it's too personally based so i'm going to twist a question that's been asked slightly to okay. make it less personal for you um claire um Typically, on your degree course, for example, that you're doing at York, um, what sort of A-level profile did people have? <laughs> as, as because if... the question that has been asked, I think, is a little bit too personal <laughs> to you. But I, I, I'm taking it on the assumption that it's a genuine question and, you know, it would be lovely. So when you applied to the, to, you know, uh, to, the, to the, the University of York for the course you did, what was the typical sort of A-level profile that people would have? Um, so to do biochemistry, I would recommend chemistry, biology, maths. Generally, not everybody on my course had done maths um, and there was, it was yeah, definitely not essential, but I think it was very helpful. So I would recommend that. Um, generally A's, A's and B's, if that, yeah. if that, if that was the question, then yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, I think, uh, most people on my course were probably maybe two A's and a B or upwards for yeah. biochemistry, but obviously it's very variable for different universities. Great. That's a lovely way of answering that question. It's also not, not too personal. And I know the person asking it probably wasn't meaning to be personal, no, no, no. but we just kind of have a thing where we don't ask, for example, when we use student ambassadors in our work, we we, we don't have questions of like, you know, what did you get in your A-levels and that sort of thing, just because it's putting the person on the spot of it. Hey, there's been some fantastic questions there. I love the way so many of you engage so specifically with, with some of the things that Claire's mentioned. And then I, I really personally enjoy the questions that are about sort of like your career experiences and so on. Yeah, no, really, really great range of questions. So thank you. Thank you, Claire, very much for joining us this evening. And thank you very much to our guests, our participants who've joined in too. Uh, I will send out um, a link to the recording of this uh, probably tomorrow, along with a PDF of all the slides used. And yeah, thanks very much, Claire. Thank you very much, our guests. Thank you very much. And thank you for everyone to come and listen. Cheerio. Goodbye.